primarily be from an American perspective. The secondary name of the series, Timeline 191, comes from the point of divergence from real history. In 1862, at the height of the American Civil War, Confederate General Robert E. Lee sent out an order to his army to march north through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. This order was called Special Order 191. The Confederates were planning on invading the North in order to force them to recognize Southern independence. The order involved splitting the Army of Northern Virginia into multiple parts and taking separate routes into Pennsylvania so that the Union commanders couldn't figure out what was going on until it was too late. But a Confederate officer accidentally left behind a copy of the order when his unit moved and it was picked up by enemy soldiers. This allowed Union General George McClellan to predict the route of the invasion and halt it at the Battle of Antietam. The point of divergence from our timeline is simple. The orders were never found and the Army of Northern Virginia was able to smash the Union forces in Pennsylvania, even occupying Philadelphia for a time. This victory gave France and the United Kingdom an excuse to recognize the independence of the CSA and forced Abraham Lincoln to give up on emancipating America's slaves. Due to these events, the U.S. government capitulated and the CSA was granted independence. Not only that, but they were able to absorb the state of Kentucky and the Indian Territory, which is Oklahoma in our timeline. West Virginia still split off from Virginia and rejoined the U.S., though. That's the gist of it, anyway. Let's examine how all these changes rate on the scale. The Union Army never finding Special Order 191 is rated as likely. To be frank, it's kind of amazing that the officer who left it behind was so careless in the first place. He literally just wrapped it around a couple of cigars and dropped it in a field. Robert E. Lee defeating McClellan and smashing the Army of the Potomac is also likely. While the difference in abilities between Northern and Southern generals is greatly exaggerated in popular imagination, the idea that McClellan was pretty incompetent is accurate. He wasn't a total idiot. He was great at organizing and meticulous planning, but he was far too cautious to be an effective battlefield commander. When faced with a more aggressive general like Lee, he would probably have been completely steamrolled. In real life, he was able to win the Battle of Antietam, but he didn't pursue Lee's army, even though he had the initiative. As for France and the UK recognizing the CSA, eh, well, that's a more complicated question to answer. Let's start with the UK. The idea of them supporting a nation founded for the express purpose of preserving slavery is very unlikely. Almost impossible. In many ways, Great Britain was the place that started the abolition movement. They outlawed the slave trade in 1807 and got rid of slavery entirely as early as 1833. The general populace was very anti-slavery. They viewed the British Empire as a force that uplifted savages, while the other European empires were simply out for profit. Slavery was uncivilized, in other words. In fact, in real life, the CSA tried to strong-arm European powers into helping them by embargoing exports of cotton. Instead, they just started getting their cotton from Egypt and India, which wound up being cheaper anyways. The question of France is a little more difficult to answer, though. At the time, France was a monarchy run by Emperor Napoleon III. Not only that, but he was in the middle of invading Mexico to set up a friendly monarchy over there. The reasons for this are complicated, but Napoleon felt confident in his abilities to succeed since the Americans were preoccupied with their own war. And in this timeline, his gambit worked. He crushed the Mexican Republic and installed Maximilian I as emperor. I would say that France's recognition of the CSA's independence is likely. It would gain them a new ally, prevent the US from intervening in Mexico, and cost them basically nothing. Napoleon actually being able to take over Mexico is... Uh, plausible. By 1865, the French as well as the Mexican monarchists had managed to take control of most of the country. But in real life, the U.S. began sending weapons and other support to the Mexican Republicans at this time, giving them a few victories and causing Napoleon to cut his losses. It should be noted that Mexican Republicans have nothing to do with the American political party. They're just people that want a republic for their government instead of a monarchy. Americans are just really bad at naming things. The biggest advantage that the French Empire had over Mexico was its industrial capacity. At the time, Mexico had very few factories and railroads, especially in the north. This means that they would have had a hard time making weapons and transporting supplies. Their disadvantage was that they had to transport most everything across the Atlantic Ocean, so the whole venture was ungodly expensive. If the war kept going, then France would have the advantage, and they very well could have conquered the whole country. It's also totally possible that they would have overextended themselves and the Mexicans would have thrown them out, so that's why this one is just plausible. So with several major victories under their belt and the support of the world's biggest powers, could the Confederate States fully split off from the United States? This is the crux of the entire setting, after all. I've already mentioned my issues with some of the other changes, but if we assume that they all happened as described in the books, then I think it's very likely that the CSA would gain independence. The American military was in complete disarray, and a large subset of their population was already against the war. 
With the threat of a foreign invasion over their heads, public opinion would have turned against the war completely, and President Lincoln would have had no choice but to capitulate. Finally, let's look at the CSA's conquests of Kentucky and the Indian Territory. Before the outbreak of the war, the Indian Territory had several forts manned by Union soldiers, but they were all pulled out to other key areas. Not long afterwards, the Confederate Army opened negotiations with some of the tribes that lived there. Many of them agreed to support the CSA, but others stayed pro-Union, and as such they began fighting amongst themselves. This continued until the end of the war when the Union Army came back to the territory. In this timeline, though, the Union Army never came, which allowed the pro-CSA forces to emerge victorious. I'll just come right out and say that this is a likely outcome. Most of the pro-Union forces fled to Kansas early in the war, meaning that the territory had to be reconquered later. And with the U.S. in no position to do that, the territory being annexed into the CSA seems almost inevitable. Kentucky is weirder, though. Before the war, Kentucky was a slave state. Well, okay, technically it's a commonwealth, but no one calls it that. Work with me. And it actually declared neutrality early on. The majority of the population was pro-Union, though as well as most of the state legislature. In September of 1861, Confederate forces occupied the town of Columbus, which caused Union forces to move in and intercept, which caused the legislature to officially declare for the Union. The CSA attempted a full-on invasion in 1862, and without going into too much detail, it went really well for them. They were forced out a few months later by an advancing Union army. However, this army wouldn't have existed in Harry Turtledove's timeline, so the CSA would probably have taken control of the whole state. I just don't think that they could have maintained political control of a region that was so sympathetic to the northern cause is all. There were still plenty of Confederate sympathizers in Kentucky, though, so this change is rated somewhere between unlikely and plausible. As for West Virginia, I think that it would go more or less the same as in real life. See, it was part of Virginia at the time, but after the government in Richmond declared independence, another government formed in the Northwest. At first, they claimed to be the rightful government of all Virginia, but by April of 1862, they had declared themselves to be a new state. This was all done before Special Order 191 was discovered, so that wouldn't change anything. And with the CSA busy trying to bring its new territories under control, it probably wouldn't have the power to enforce its will on West Virginia. Of course, they would really resent losing any territory, so they might throw all of their weight into taking it back. So it's a wash. This is just a plausible outcome. So one tiny change to the timeline results in a North America that's totally different than in our world. Bigger changes are coming, though. Especially once we reach... After the war ended, a lot of small changes occurred in American politics. For starters, the war is called the War of Secession instead of the Civil War. Beyond that, the Republican Party fell from power in the elections of 1864, the CSA purchased Cuba and Puerto Rico from Spain, then it attempted to purchase the Mexican states of Sonora and Chihuahua. In response to this, the U.S. declared war again, ostensibly to protect Mexican territory from being taken by an imperialist power. This kicked off a conflict known as the Second Mexican War, in which the combined CSA, French, and British forces beat the United States into total submission. In exchange for this help, though, Britain forced the Confederates to free all of their slaves. That's a lot to take in, so let's get started. Keep in mind that from here on, we're assuming that all the previous changes occurred exactly as they were described in the books, however unlikely they were. Let's start with the decline of the Republican Party. Since Lincoln and the radically progressive Republicans were seen as the cause for the war, they were voted out pretty quickly afterwards, and the more conservative Democrats took control. That's not a mistake, by the way. The parties have changed completely in the past 150 years. The Republicans were voted back into power in 1880, since the public wanted the government to take a harder stance on the Confederates. This seems likely. The American public tends to seesaw back and forth between which party they blame for their problems, even today. Here's where it gets trickier. After the war, the party collapsed again. Many of its members, including former President Lincoln, left to join the newly formed Socialist Party, and it became little more than a regional party in the Midwest. Let's take a second to examine the Socialist thing, because I'm sure the comments here will be a shit show anyways. The Republicans were radically progressive for their time period, but most people only view that in the context of slavery. Abraham Lincoln was also a huge proponent for workers' rights, and he even made several statements that line up with the labor theory of value. Without going into too much depth, this theory states that the value of a good or service is derived from the labor required to produce it, rather than the supply or the demand. Aspects of the LTV are often invoked by socialists, and it's also central to Marxism, which maintains that under capitalism the working class is exploited by the bourgeoisie. To be clear, these statements alone don't mean that Lincoln was advocating for the abolishment of capitalism or collective control of the means of production, but they do show that he had a view of economics that fundamentally differs from just about every capitalist economic theory. 
He was closer to being a socialist than most every American politician at the time. In addition, people's beliefs change over time. It's impossible to say how Lincoln's experiences would have shaped him, but it's not crazy to say that he would have moved further to the left. Not only that, but with the more conservative